they have to be very careful that any of my workers do not contract the virus and pass it on. That would be catastrophic, not just personally, business is business, but that would be terrible for us. So yeah, there's a lot of anxiety we live with at the moment. I myself went to my doctors to pick up my hormone therapy and suddenly got told they're not going to see me anymore. Um, and I go and find a new doctor and I was like, wait, what's, what's going on? I've been here with you for 15 years in the middle of the pandemic. And it was, you know, my feeling was, is that there was a new doctor there and she just didn't want to deal with trans patients. It can't be, I'm going to listen and then tell you what you need to know. That's the, that's the issue that we're having. We are equal and we have a right to a voice and people have a right to I'm pleased to present Managing Director of Alternative Care Services, Ramses Underhill Smith's story. is Underhill Smith. My pronouns are he, him. I am the Managing Director and Founder of Alternative Care Services, which is the UK's first and only LGBT HIV focused care company. Um, we started four years ago and we mainly operate in the London area. We have just gone into supported living, which means, uh, so the domiciliary care is, is for sort of senior people, people who need care at home. We've just gone into supported living where we're giving young people support to live independently. Um, and, and we're outside of London now. We've, uh, we've moved outside of London to offer services and we get calls from Scotland, Cornwall, all over the country. The LGBT community are all over the country. And more and more we're finding <clears throat> that our services are needed and we need other people to do to deliver services like this. Um, you know, we're, we're really excited about being able to offer a young gay man supported living. Um, and his council fought that quite a lot. Um, but there's no one else that could give him the service. So, you know, that's uh, that's our, what that's that's our first young person um, we're, we're giving services to, which is really exciting. Current situations, I say current situations because there's two situations as far as I can see is happening for <clears throat> people of colour particularly right now. One is the Black Lives Matter movement and the other one is COVID-19 and both of them impact in a, well, impact can impact in, 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 in various ways but for me both of them have caused a lot of anxiety. Giving care to people, social care, they have to be very careful that any of my workers do not contract the virus and pass it on. That would be catastrophic, not just personally, um, for every, well, mainly personally, uh, you, know, you know, business is business, but that would be terrible for us. So yeah, there's a lot of anxiety we live with at the moment. But with the anxieties, um, <clears throat> by doing a lot of reading, a lot of reaching out to people, I go to therapy groups, um, you know, there are lots of Zoom therapy groups around and a lot of, a lot of um, Zoom groups have spread up through COVID-19 and, and, and the Black Lives Matter. And it's just really, I just do a lot of talking it out. Um, I, I subscribe to Netflix for the first time in my life. Um, and I absolutely love it. It's given me the whole ray of um, escapism. I, you know, I'm, I don't watch... I don't watch uh, horrors or anything like that. I like funny stuff. Um, and there's a selection of, of things that are culturally different that I would never have been able to see, um, which I, and I find that really refreshing because I feel like I'm connecting with the world on a, on a, on a bigger, you know, <clears throat> on a, yeah, on a bigger level. How, how we need to be supported, I think, you know, and I, 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 I'm, the, I'm on the board of directors for Spectrum and I'm the co-chair of, uh, of um, FTM London, which is a transmasculine organisation and we have Zoom meetings monthly and that's been really helpful for me supporting other people. So um, I, I see the huge surge in the need for support from the, all the LGBT community. Because 
know, uh, with, 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 with Spectra, we offered um, financial help, particularly to the trans community because, you know, we're in lockdown and you, you know, you're not able to get out with this group of people are always more often underrepresented. Um, and financially, you know, it's difficult for people to find work. And so it's, um, it's, been, it's been part of the therapy for me to offer support. Um, but just being in those safe spaces is, is, uh, is, is so powerful. You know, the Gender Recognition Act is, you know, is, we're having issues around all of that. So all the anxiety, you know, um, certain organizations now cannot prescribe hormone therapy. Uh, yeah, I myself went to my doctors to pick up my hormone therapy and suddenly got told they're not going to see me anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and I go and find a new doctor and I was like, wait, what's, what's going on? I've been here with you for 15 years in the middle of the pandemic. And it was, you know, my feeling was, is that there was a new doctor there and she just didn't want to deal with trans patients. So um, she said, great, that's it, you're out the door. And so that was a little bit of a shock to me, but I kind of haven't even thought about it since yesterday, you know, um, and I was, I'm going to have to think about it and address it. But, you know, those discriminations are, are really there, I, I, you know, and, um, you know, I, I did ask for a, an explanation and she just said she didn't feel comfortable prescribing hormone therapies anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important that the LGBT community come together and support each other in any way. So, um, what does pride mean to me? I think more than ever, pride means to me the absence of shame. Uh, I felt um, very ashamed of myself and my, uh, my gender for you know for all of my life and i think i've come i'm coming out of that and i think that's the, the very powerful thing my children come with me to pride now um it's and it's they've been coming for a couple of years and now i at first i felt really oh, excited now i just think oh, i don't want them to come anymore they're <laughs> cramping my style but that's a good place to be um for me i feel very validated to be to be alive you know i understand that people don't know what they don't know it surprises i have a friend who is a cis white man gay man and and he's been around me and and the black community the ame community for decades and i was talking to him about colorism and he didn't and he didn't and he didn't know and i just thought I thought I had just assumed because he, culturally he knew so much about, he knew every, and, and it just shows me, actually you don't know a lot of things. You know, and I was sharing it with him about colorisms and he was like, oh my goodness, I never knew that. <coughs> and um, so I understand that you don't know what you don't know, but you also have to, I think the feeling of dominance and superiority um, that, that comes with with being white, uh, and w- w- whether w- whether you whether whether you accept it or you don't accept it, that's the situation. And so dominance and and, and, and subservient, and that's the dynamic around the, you know the globe. Um, so when you say I'm going to listen, it can't be I'm going to listen and then tell you what you need to know. Because I want equality. I've had to really work hard to make sure I give that to other people. And sometimes it's difficult, but the willingness has to be there. And one of the things that I talk about is racism inside of the LGBT community that goes unaddressed. And, and, and that, my feeling for that is, is that, you know, the, the sort of mainstream organizations don't want to say anything because they don't want to be seen as to be homophobic. And this, this racism and prejudice and stuff is, is rampant in the LGBT community and no one wants to talk about it. <laughs> you know, and so we need to sell. You want equality, just like Black Lives Matter, Black Trans Lives Matter. You know, we need to sort to, to demonstrate that actually this is uh, this is you know everyone has a right to that space. And having a couple of people on the board or a couple of people in your organisation doesn't mean you, that you're inclusive. <clears throat> Organisations cherry pick the the people of colour they want around them, so they they will interview and pick people that sound like them 
even though the skin type, the skin is different. Oh, right, you're acceptable because you don't challenge me. And so coming to the organization, and then it's, well, we've got three or four, you know, people of color, uh, you know, but just because someone's of color doesn't mean that they're gonna challenge you in the way, you know, I find I've, in the, in the struggle that I've found in the last four years since I've been running my organization is when I bring up the lack of diversity, um, I'm, there's this whole feeling of people roll their eyes, and, and then you, what, what that does is that traumatizes you so what it has done is traumatize me. So I go away and I just don't want to be included in those groups anymore. So I stop going to these events and then, you know, I will become, then people say, oh God, you're, you know, you're really hard to reach. I was talking to somebody about being um, excluded from a particular section of, of um, social care. I said, well, I'm the only person doing sort of senior social care and I'm, no one talks about me. Why is that? I don't understand why you're talking about other organizers, you don't talk about me. And that person said to me, well, you know, do the black, do you get coverage from the black press? And I thought, well, what has that got to do with anything? What has that got to do with anything? So what you're saying is, is that you can justify me being excluded because you think the black people are, the you know, black press aren't gonna include me because they're homophobic. And I just thought you actually don't understand how racist that question was. Talks about intersectionality and, and so, it, it, I was very immersed in the South Asian culture and I found that I got a lot of prejudice and it really stomped me. But inside of that, there was the, the caste stuff was going on, you know, so I found that really strange that, uh, so I was, I was dating someone and they were sort of high caste and then this person was low caste and then that they didn't like me because I was black. And it was just, and so I made a film about it. Um, and that was so long ago, I can't remember the name of the film. You know, poverty, it's time that, I think that we all had a bite of the cherry. I, I shouldn't, I don't feel I should have to keep struggling to, to earn a decent living, to earn, you know. Um, it is, it's, been, it's been a challenge. The exclusion that I feel in the, in, the, in the sort of mainstream LGBT community has really been traumatic in the last few years. And I've really shed a lot of tears about it. And I felt more than being excluded from the black community for being trans, um, that I think the, the being excluded from the mainstream community, experiencing that prejudice, experiencing that, and very open sort of, you know, microaggressions very you know it's and that's i think it's impacted me much much more um yeah i i understand the cultures i understand my culture and i understand when they say little things there's, there's things that i kind of understand about it but i can still go in and amongst my community and i can still you know there are people that i, I get on with but when you're excluded from when you or when you when you suffer this um when you experience this rejection from mainstream LGBT community is very, very, very hard. It, it's a, yeah, it just reignites all those feelings of exclusion and shame and yeah.